All right, so I can see lots of participants joining. We have our speakers with us. We have our moderator with us. Um, and just give people a few more moments to connect. All right, so why don't we kick off? I'll kick off with a brief intro and then I'm gonna hand over to Deus. Um, and while I give the very brief intro, more and more people can join. So welcome everybody to MESA's third webinar, the Science for Malaria Impact. Um, I'm Kate Whitfield at the MESA team in IS Global. And the whole team is thrilled to welcome you to this series, this webinar series that's dedicated to showcasing cutting edge research from the malaria endemic country scientists. Today's topic is integrating genomics into the malaria toolbox. And we're gonna hear from two fantastic speakers. We have Professor Christian Happy and Dr. Stella Chenet with us. And Luckily, this webinar is in very safe hands of our moderator, Professor Deus Ishingoma from the National Institute of Medical Research in Tanzania. And let me just say a few words about Deus. He is a principal sci scientist and head of the genomics lab at the National Institute in Dar es Salaam. He completed his PhD at the University of Copenhagen on the surveillance of malaria and antimalarial drug resistance. His research focus is on surveillance of parasite populations, antimalarial drug resistance and efficacy of antimalarials, as well as capacity building. And if that wasn't all, in addition to being a member and co-founder of many collaborative networks, Darius was awarded the Alan J. McGill Fellowship from ASTMH in 2019. So Deus, thank you so much for joining us and, and agreeing to be our moderator for this webinar. I'm gonna hand over now to you and kindly ask you to introduce our speakers. Thanks so much. Thank you so much, Katie. Uh, it's a pleasure to have you introduce me and thank you for the kind words. Um, also so much excited to be moderating this uh, webinar today with two great speakers who happen to be my friends. Uh, Christian Happen and I have been working together on this broad theme of capacity building in Africa. As Tara Jeanette and I have met several times through our collaborations with the Center for uh, Disease Control and Prevention, CDC. So uh, today we'll listen from Christian and Stella. Christian Happy, uh, I'm happy to introduce you. Christian is a professor of molecular biology and genomics and the director of the World Bank funded African Center of Excellence for Genomics of Infectious Diseases, SEGID in Redeemers University in Nigeria. He obtained his PhD at the University of Ibadan and did his postdoctoral fellowship at Harvard University. He subsequently worked at Harvard University as a research scientist and became an adjunct professor at Harvard University School of Public Health between 2007 and 2011. His research interests focus on molecular biology and genomics with application in infectious diseases such as malaria, laser fever, Ebola virus diseases and HIV, not to mention the COVID-19, which is now engulfed in. Among his career accomplishments to date should be noted his use of genomics technologies for air diagnosis and confirmation within six hours of Ebola virus disease in Nigeria and the use of next generation sequencing technology perform the first sequence of SARS-CoV-2 in Africa. 
Uh, Christian's talk today will be on genomic characterization and surveillance of microbial threats in West Africa. Christian will twist a little bit his talk, but he will still uh, be talking about this area, which is at the core of his uh, activities and his life at the moment. Stella Shenet uh, obtained her PhD in microbiology in Arizona State University in USA in 2014. Later on, she developed her postdoctoral studies at the Center for Disease Control and Prevention in a, in a CDC in Atlanta, where we've, we met and have been collaborating, and also at Harvard T.H. Chan School of Public Health. Her research focuses on control and elimination of infectious diseases. Dr. Chenner has worked in malaria for over 15 years, and currently she's in charge of Molecular Epidemiology and Genomics Laboratory at the Institute of Tropical Disease from Universidad Nacional Taribio Rodriguez de Mendoza de Amazona in Peru. I'm speaking in Spanish for the first time in my life, so you will bear with me in case I misspelled anything. So Stella will have a presentation, Molecular Response network to support malaria elimination in Peru. Uh, for our webinar today, uh, we'll discuss on how we can inter integrate genomics into the malaria intervention toolbox. And our speakers well vested in this area and we'll be talking about the topics I just mentioned. Uh, Christian and Stella, you will have 15 minutes for your talks. And thereafter we'll have Q and A. And after that, will give you 30 minutes to wrap up. And so we would encourage each and every one of us to uh, write their questions in the chat box. And we'll select a few questions depending on time. And um, we'll give an opportunity to some of you to unmute and ask the questions depending on your network. And finally, we'll have uh, final remarks from Kate and she will also announce uh, the dates and timetable for our next webinar. Without wasting so much time, it's a pleasure now uh, to give a chance to Christian to start his presentation. Welcome, Christian. Thank you, Deus. Uh, thank you for that introduction. I will, uh, um, I will go on and then share my screen with your permission. And then I will, uh, if you are okay, and if the screen is fine, let me know. So I can really move on. I don't know if you yes. see the screen. Okay. I can see so it, I, I can see it, please go ahead. Okay, okay, I twisted my talk a little bit. And then where I talk about pathogen genomics, learning from viruses, you know, and applying to malaria parasites. So, and um, as Darius mentioned, so uh, my lab is at the African Center of Excellence for Genomic and Infection Disease at Regents University. I'm the director of uh, the center. And then uh, we are a WHO and Africa CDC reference lab uh, in Africa for genomic infectious disease genomics, whereby we have a mandate to do you know, innovation and research for infectious disease genomics. So this is a bit of the outline that I will be presenting today. So we'll talk a bit about uh, an African platform for pathogen genomics, which is a center, and then run you through a bit of how we've been able to use genomic epidemiology for viral, uh, viral, uh, viral hemorrhagic fevers, and then how that I also have been able to rub up, you know, on malaria research and how we basically just use that knowledge and bring it to the fore for malaria and work with the National Malaria Elimination Program in Nigeria, for instance, you know, to uh, effective malaria control in the country. So, and then we basically start by talking about genomic uh, revolution and how that has really revolutionized the way, you know, we approach healthcare research. And also, you know, one of the major challenge for that is also the fact that Africa is not contributing. And the reason why Africa is not contributing is simply because the knowledge is not there, there are also the platforms and then the infrastructures are not there. But then we basically try to meet, uh, bridge that gap by searching up this platform called the Africa Center of Excellence for Genomic of Infectious Disease. And that um, a platform has, I mean, as an acting goal to create a vibrant academic and research environment that transcends national boundaries where we, where, the, where Africans and, and our partners in the world can do relevant, responsive, 
highly you know, ethical and translational genomic research. In doing this, we really plan to develop, build a critical mass of young, African, uh, young Africans that can basically use and empower them to use genomic knowledge, genomic-based tool for uh, elimination and control of infectious diseases. Malaria is one of them. But then building curricula and also engage communities in prevention effort and public health education. So in order to do this, we basically look at one problem. What is a problem that is very common to infectious diseases in Africa? I think the common denominator to most infectious diseases is fever. So, but then in Africa, most of the time, you know, when fever is when people present with fever, malaria is often the first culprit. And because malaria is often misdiagnosed and then mistreated, then that actually drives drug resistance, as we know. So then our goal basically was to you know, come up with a thematic area that can help us to understand the microbial landscape, understand the viruses and the parasites circulating, characterize them, and then use them to develop countermeasures, such like you know, diagnostic treatment and then, you know, and, then, and then vaccines. So, but then in doing this, we really basically, you know, these two programs, which is the education part of it, which was the first one is supported by the World Bank and then the research supported by the NIH. We believe that, you know, doing this, we're meeting Africa critical needs for genomic education and research. And then if you look at the Venn diagram that I have here, so I think you will realize that that critical need is actually the intersection between education and research that has to do with capacity building. That is capacity building in genomic teachings and then setting up sequencing facilities, diagnostic core, when they still talk about genomic diagnostic core. And then also, you know, build up as a build a sustainable, you know, science career, platform for sustainable science career in, in your, among young Africans. And while doing this, I think, you know, ultimately our goal is actually to develop that next generation of African pathogen hunters, doing this in Africa in collaboration with partners outside Africa, but, but doing this whole work within Africa and then empowering these young Africans to you know, catch up these viruses or hunt these viruses, catch them and the parasite, characterize them early enough before they come back to us because we realize that with the COVID-19 pandemic, what we've been playing in the world as a global community, we've been playing defense. You know, we are, we are very reactive in the way we, we, we work in, in this space. And then there is a need for us to think about setting up a platform that can enable us to start being more proactive, you know, than we are right now. So and in the next few slides, I will show you how we've been able to use and harness, you know, knowledge of pathogen genomics as a way to help respond to outbreak in, in Africa. And then this will start with the Ebola outbreak in 2014, you know, in West Africa. So when this outbreak started in West Africa, prior to 2014, there was no time ever that genomics have been, have been used in order to help, you know, public health respond to outbreak. But we pioneered that by actually using the first genomes. I mean, using genomics for the first time in public health. You know, in the first, when Ebola started in, 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 in Guinea in, 20, in 2013, toward the tail end of 2013, so I, I, I gathered a few friends of mine and then we started thinking about how do we, you know, uh, do, what do we do if Ebola spilled out of Guinea to the rest of Africa and then through West Africa? Then the first thing we identified that, <clears throat> that we could do was, you know, diagnostics. And how do we, you know, diagnose, how do you can, you can manage your disease if you can't even detect it or diagnose it in the first instance. So what we did was we had to set up the diagnostic platform in Sierra Leone, in Nigeria, in Senegal and other countries where we have our network. And then as we already predicted, you know, on May 20, you know, uh, 2014, one of the, the scientists that we trained actually identified the first case of Ebola in, in, in Sierra Leone. And then that really became very important and a major, major milestone for us because within the first three weeks of the outbreak in that country, we were able to, you know, to perf perf perform the first 99 full genome sequence of Ebola ever done in the, in the context of an outbreak. And we basically pioneer what today is called open data sharing and open data access. We created a database where we made the sequences available and accessible by everyone in the international community because we're more interested in saving lives and then generating information that were critical to produce countermeasures. So this was the very first time this was done in the context of an epidemic on epidemic response. And you will see in the next few slides how we're able to use this information in order to help public health response. So we did something that was unprecedented. That is from the time of collection of sample to the time where we dropped the sample in the database in NCBI, this was about 10 days. And that really, really was unprecedented. And that and our publication could not come back on. I mean, came out about months after, you know, we started doing this. And that for us was unprecedented and critical. 
But then this is what we're showing like a, a first use case, for instance, how we able to show clearly, you know, what we see today with a different variant that we see called alpha, beta, gamma for SARS-CoV-2. But in, in the case of, 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 of Ebola, if you see the, the diagram here, between May 26 and then June 16 in Sierra Leone, we're able to show how one particular variant that was introduced in Sierra Leone later on, around June, took over and it became the most predominant variant and became the, the variant that was driving and following the transmission. And this variant actually would further characterize and show that they had mutations that were actually responsible for increased transmissibility. And that really became the very first time during an outbreak where you could actually characterize a virus and create a relationship between the presence of mutation in the GPE protein in the case of Ebola and increased transmissibility. And then we show clearly that, they, they, I mean, the, 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 the uh, the, the explosion of cases in Sierra Leone at the time was due to sustained human to human transmission. There was no additional uh, zoonotic introduction from the reservoirs and then newly imported, you know, a barrel from other countries. That really became very important for the country to start understanding where the hotspot and in the pocket. As I mentioned before, we characterize this, this virus. We understand the, the, the mutation where they were. We identified 27 mutations that were fixed. And then some of those mutations were increasing, uh, were involving increased transmissibility. But what became very important was also the fact that we brought in not only you know, the knowledge of genomics, but we were able to show you know, live and in real time how you could use genomics to track you know, the spread of a disease and then track transmission, not only within a country, but within a region. If you, when I click here next time, you could see here within, this is showing the time frame, and any one you see, these are connections, these are transmission from person to person, from places to places, from country to countries. And then this really shows the power, the firepower behind genomics and how you could use genomic as a way, you know, to track an epidemic or track a pandemic. And this really was the first time this was done. But this really became very a, a major, a major turning point, you know, in order to explain how you could use such a technology and such an approach to explain, I mean, to, to solve public health problems. If this is the next use case I will talk about is a surge of Lassa fever in Nigeria in 2018. This is where in six weeks in the early part of 2018, we have more cases of Lassa fever in the country than in the past two years combined. So the country was actually confronted with many questions and these public health questions were, are they dealing with new variant? Is it due to human to human transmission or are the diagnosis not effective? So once again, we use genomics, like real-time genomics in order to respond. We collected the first samples in the first few days and eventually did 300 full genomes and then did this within Nigeria, but have the Nigerian government to answer the question. And we were able to, I mean, we showed clearly in this case that there was no evidence of particular viral, a new viral strain, no evidence of increased human to human, uh, sustained human to human transmission, but that the surge that we observed in Nigeria was due to multiple introduction of genetically independent viruses, viruses, but all coming from the same animal reservoirs in the country. And we had this, uh, but more importantly, was the fact that we actually showed that depending on where you were in Nigeria, you could see here in the northern part of Nigeria that there was one particular variant of the virus circulating. In the western part of Nigeria, there was another particular variant, and then in the eastern part, there was another variant. Interestingly, all of these variants were separated by natural, you know, boundaries. These are rivers. This is the Benue River, and this is the Niger River in the case of Nigeria, and then this is the Niger River. This again was a clear demonstration that the rodents, be it in the, in the north, in the east, or in the west, were flowing in transmission. And then we actually went further to confirm that. And then we had this paper published, you know, in, in, uh, in, in the New England Journal of Tropical Medicine. So here, this is again showing clearly how you could use data. This is here a shout out from the WHO and the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, how we're able to use sequencing in order to help you know, public health to respond. Then the, another case, use case that I'll show here, this is a case whereby one of, I mean, uh, this is a graduate student in our lab who eventually used real-time metagenomic to actually unveil, you know, a case of an, 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 a, a case of yellow fever. But then before it became a yellow fever, I just want to tell you that within the first, I mean, around December, November, December, 2018, within two weeks, there were 179 school children that died in the Southern part of Nigeria. All tests, you know, involving things like Lassa fever, malaria, Ebola, and the yellow fever all proved negative. Then the sample were, were sent to our lab within 48 hours, we were able to show clearly that we're dealing with a lineage of yellow fever that was very different from the ones that have been circulating. These are they all cluster here, very different from the ones that have been circulating in Nigeria in the past 94 years. Then th that's the reason, because of all of the changes in the targeted area, then the diagnosis or the molecular diagnosis is proved negative. So this information were given to the Nigeria Center for Disease Control, they declare an outbreak, and then 
you know, within two weeks, they were, they were able to contain that outbreak successfully. Now let's fast forward to COVID, you know, before we come back to malaria. So when COVID started in, in Africa, we received the very first uh, sample in sub-Saharan Africa. So the sample was from a suspected, I mean, COVID patient, a COVID patient. The sample was sent to a lab by the Nigeria Center for Disease Control. And for us to do this and to achieve this fit, we actually put the big, the, the, we pull out the big guns, pull out the automation and then brought out things like this big Novasic, you know, which is the only one still on the African continent. But what we did was basically unprecedented. Turn around time 48 hours, we were able to produce the first gene SARS CoV 2 genome in Africa within 48 hours. We knew exactly where this came from. You know, that the, although the traveler was from, from Switzerland, he got infected, I mean, from Italy, he got infected around, you know, around Germany. So we have all of this information, and it was a clear demonstration that the virus was imported in the country and that there was no local transmission. But we went further, you know, during the process of COVID, for instance, this is a bit older in terms of slide. We've been able to map a country like Nigeria, knowing in real time what are the hotspots that you see in red, and then where are these areas where the sink that you see a little bit lighter. But then that really gave us an idea. We know exactly where the, where the, the different variants circulating in the country. We know exactly what's going on in, I mean, Nigeria is about 27 states. We have, I mean, covered about 26, which is more than two thirds of the country during the period. We know exactly in each state here, what you see here, where the different lineages of the variants circulating. We've identified variants of concerns of variants of, and, and variants of under investigation. So we know that I mean, there are 45 different variants circulating in Nigeria among with the variants of concerns and then the variants of our investigation. We've discovered new variants, but what is important is also the fact that when it comes to genomics, for instance, and applied to public health response, you could see here again here where in real time you could see within Nigeria, we're identifying the different variants and the different lineages in different places. And this information is given in real time to the national public health authorities, and then they use this as a way to respond. So a lot of people will be wondering what is the magic that Africans are doing, and then it's some of these things that we're doing in the background. We are doing it not only for Nigeria, but we've also done it for many African countries, from Somalia to Sudan to Rwanda. We'll do all of this work and they share back to the countries and then they can actually do this public health intervention. Let's fast forward to, you know, to the, the application of some of this into malaria. So we we'll work in very close collaboration with the National Malaria Elimination Program in Nigeria, and they will have to generate data to inform policies. You know, we have, I've been on this space before where we use the molecular markers to have Nigeria change policies in 2005. But then after that policy, we've been working in very close collaboration with them in order to study, you know, the effect of the different intervention, be it, you know, uh, the use of insecticide to connect, and then the, the use of uh, things like um, a seasonal malaria chemoprophylaxis, and then other interventions on the parasite population structure and diversity in Nigeria. So we'll use things like, you know, MSP1, microsatellite, and then the back route in order to see how the parasite, you know, structure is evolving in the country. In, in the country. So we basically identify, you know, some key, key messages. And they are that the fact that, yes, we've gone to, um, from a very high parasite diversity, we've gone from a situation whereby you used to have like 12 different parasites per infection to very close to, uh, to two or three now. So which means that those measures are working, but we also know that despite that the transmission is very high in a country like Nigeria. So you could see here how we use, you know, the SNP barcode to characterize some of these parasites. We use microsatellite also to look at those, you know, and then that really has been very helpful. But then when you look at the country, as I showed you in the mask before, you realize that, you know, despite the fact that, you know, uh, diversity is high, the, the substructure of the population of the parasite is very low. So which means that they're really not different, regardless of where you are within Nigeria in terms of the parasite structure. Looking at the molecular markers of resistance, we look at what happened 10 years after chloro, after we changed from chloroquine to ACTs. We also, I mean, one thing that we just passed to the government recently is the fact that, you know, the mutations, you know, related, I mean, chloroquine resistant markers are still very high in the countries. You can see here, look at this haplotype, the C at haplotype, we see having about 53.8%. That shows that you know, in a way, there's many other things that are driving, you know, or sustaining the, the selection of those markers. It could be the use of chloroquine over the counter that is circulating, or other molecules that could have that could be driving, you know, the genomes in a very selective manner. So then, if you're looking at the ACTs, then I remember in 2009 we published one of the first set of papers that looking at some of this haplotype related to the use of ACTs. We can also see some kind of balancing selection compared to what, what we used to observe in the era of chloroquine and then amodarquine drugs in those days. So really in Nigeria, you could see that really this particular upload that, that has been selected over the years and that really is being consistent. Then it shows clearly how you could use our drugs or the drug uses actually shaping the genomes and characterizing the genome 
in a very different manner. Now, the key finding is the fact that, you know, we can go on and then see that, yes, even though we say have those mutations in, in, in the CRT and MDR uploader that we just talked about, the ACTs are still not affected, but then that really also becomes important in the fact that, yes, we see these markers, but then they are also selected in a, in a, in a very different way. Now, if we look at the DHFR and DHPS, in 2005, we found the, you know, the, 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 six, the K640E uh, e mutation, the G640E mutation, in the, uh, 540 mutation. But then this time, along 10 years later, that mutation has actually disappeared. So which means that you know, this particular mutant that is very responsible for high level chloroquine resistance, I mean, sulfadoxin pyrimetine resistance that is gone. Then that shows how if you withdraw the drug or you reduce the use of the drug, that can really help you know, in a big way. So we've actually lost the quintuple mutant in Nigeria as report, I mean, unlike it reported in 2005, and that also is very important. Now, I will probably talk about how the work that we're also doing on looking, I mean, monitoring the current surgeon polymorphism associated with that insulin resistance. Yes, we've seen, you know, over the years, we've been working with the National Malaria Control Program. In summary, we've seen some polymorphisms, you know, in the character uh, gene, some of them are very specific to Nigeria, and they're not really shared with other countries. We have not demonstrated, a, I mean, a real association between this, this genotype and the phenotype by in vitro studies or, produced, or looking at uh, 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 treatment failures. But what we see here in the next few slides is a bit what, we, what we're observing. You could see here, this is a study, and then you could see this particular mutation that is very consistent, you know, depending whether you use air or dihydropipiroquine. The, the, the so you could see here, and then these are patients that are failing you know, treatment or they are coming with a recruitment infection in those days. So this, we are monitoring this mutation very, very uh, uh, particularly because this is something that is very specific to Nigeria. So I really just wanted to bring this to the fore. And then when we look at the population, all of this mutation, you know, for the care gene in Nigeria, there's really no difference depending on where you are. They're confirming the fact that we say substructure in the country, you know, is pretty much the same. Then we also realize that the Nigerian mutations are, are clustering pretty much together. You can see here, this mutation here in, in this tree, where you have Brazil, DRC, and others, you know, previous mutations, you know, all clustering together. But then these are new set of things that we are seeing in Nigeria. They are all clustering also in, the, in, in another part of the tree. Then lastly, what I will talk about is actually our discovery of, of plasmodial bivax, bivax in indigenous population in Nigeria. So here, for instance, we're just giving you, you know, a clue of what happens here. This is a study where we basically were studying fasciprum, but we actually eventually, you know, pull up a whole genome or bivax genome in those populations. And then looking at those genomes and then the Duffy binding proteins, we've been able to actually identify and put that together and ensure that they share you know, similarity with the SAR1 strain. You know, that really is something that is very important. But if you're looking at the virus from Nigeria, they are very clustered, they cluster all together. But by the one we look at the PCA, you realize that, you know, they are really clustering, you know, with, with South American, you know, strains of virus. So for us, we think that, you know, maybe we will see, I mean, this is hypothetical. It's very possible, very, very possible, as I'm saying, that, you know, maybe virus, I mean, might have moved down to South America to slave trade, who knows? So again, this is something that we're investigating. I really do not want to be too forward on this. But then for us, it's very important, you know, finding to see that we're finding this in indigenous population in Nigeria. And that's really most of the time, when you find, you know, virus in populations in Africa, if you look at it very well, they are often in, countries where you have a very strong population admixture, like in East Africa, where you have a lot of, you know, strong population admixture between Arabs, Asians, and then Africans like Madagascar or Mauritania, but then very difficult to find in local African population. So I think in summary, I just want to really round up here to say that this is what we know. We know that it's a, a high parasite diversity in the country, the population structure is very low for malaria. Then, you know, we know about chloroquine, then there's a really, you know, molecular evidence to support that SP and IPT can be used. So I want to narrow it down to malaria, but I really want to talk about the emergence of virus in this local population. But ultimately, you know, it is clear from this presentation that some of the very strong points that you could use in um, um, bar viral genomics can actually be transposed to malaria. And then I think that, you know, there's an opportunity here to think about how we can transpose some of those tools and technologies that we've already set up for viral genomic into malaria research, and then build a very strong collaboration between the, I mean, between the genomic platforms that we set up and then the national malaria elimination and control programs. 
So on this, I really want to thank you and then thank you for giving me the opportunity and then thank you for giving the platform to present. Thank you. You're muted, Dems. Thank you so much, Christian. This is uh, back to you for Q&A. You have 15 minutes. Stella, please unmute and start your presentation. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, thank you for the excellent uh, talk, uh, Christian. It was very enlightening. Um, well, I will proceed to share my presentation. Okay, so thank you very much for the invitation. Today, I will be presenting a project that we are trying to implement in Amazonas, Peru. Uh, currently, I'm working at the Institute of Tropical Diseases uh, in Amazonas at the National University Toribio Rodriguez de Mendoza. And um, our lab is kind of new. So uh, I, I apologize for not having like a lot of data to present, but uh, I will uh, talk a little bit about where, what we're trying to build in this uh, area that has been neglected for so many years. So um, just to give you a brief insight about where uh, we are right now, it's, uh, it's here in, in Chachapoyas, Amazonas. So we have here Peru and um, the university is, quite, is kind of new, it has around 20 years old, and that's why uh, in this area it's important to uh, build capacities and also to train uh, students in health areas to deal with uh, infectious diseases and neglected tropical diseases that uh, are part of uh, these uh, areas, uh, basically Amazonas and Loreto. So uh, Peru is one of the countries in South America with the highest number of malaria cases. And most of the cases are from of Plasmodium vivax origin, but we also have some Plasmodium falciparum cases. As we can see here in this figure, um, the number of malaria cases have decreased uh, in the last years. This given because of the very good action of the Malaria Zero program implemented by the government. And this has been very successful in uh, Loreto. However, in Amazonas, we have here the Amazonas graph, we have seen an increase, a 2.5 fold increase from 2018 to 2019 and the beginning of 2020. So this was very concerning, especially for uh, malaria control efforts, given that the Malaria Zero Program was working very well in Peru, but uh, we didn't get that success in Amazonas. One of the reasons was uh, because of uh, a recent Plasmodium falciparum outbreak. And to give you a little bit more insight of why is this area important, we have here, as I mentioned, Loreto, which, is, which actually has most of the malaria cases, right? around 95% of them. And then we have Amazonas, which is the second region of Peru with the highest number of malaria cases. And the thing here is that uh, in the north part of this region, uh, in a province called Condor Kanki, we have native communities living alongside the uh, Santiago River with no uh, electricity, with no uh, basic services that, uh, of course, uh, where, where we have all the environment for endemic diseases and, of course, uh, for malaria uh, to be difficult to control because this is a very, uh, in, in, in a, a place with no, uh, sorry, someone, uh, is someone talking by the chat? I, I couldn't see that. Okay, yes. So um, one of the things that uh, we did when we actually arrived there uh, is uh, um, an intervention with the regional direction of health in Amazonas to uh, be familiarized with the area and also to make sure that uh, we, 
we map all the health posts and the particular uh, native communities in the area that could be uh, follow up and make sure that proper uh, diagnostic tools could be implemented there. Because right now they only rely in microscopy and in some and they use some RDTs. And as we know, uh, the use of RDTs in these areas are problematic given the uh, HRP2, HRP, HRP3 deletion. So something that uh, we're trying to implement in these areas, of course, is uh, or support them with the molecular diagnosis. So, um, the problem in Amazonas, actually, uh, and the increase in the number of cases was uh, given also by the introduction of plasmodium falciparum cases. In this area, we didn't see any cases for the last, any falciparum cases for the last 13 years until uh, 2018. In 2006, we saw some, of, some falciparum cases, but these were introduced from uh, Loreto the nearby region that has a, a lot of these cases. But in 2019, we actually saw some, uh, some autochthonous cases. And this, was, uh, and this was very important to report and actually very important to track. And of course, under these conditions, we need some uh, molecular surveillance tools to make sure uh, or, or to know if the cases are coming from either uh, Loreto or from uh, Ecuador, where we have a, a, a border there. Something interesting that we also found and that we reported in uh, this publication is that most of these uh, Plasmodium falciparum cases have very low parasitemia. So uh, it was possible that we were missing some of these infections by a uh, regular uh, microscopy. And that's why the use of, uh, of course, PCR and uh, molecular, uh, molecular tools are important to be able to uh, detect any, uh, any cases that are being uh, ignored by regular tools such as microscopy. So for this project, what we want to do is pretty much build a malaria response network. And that is something that we are building on and that we're working with uh, our collaborators. So right now, uh, we think that it's important that academia and research centers from Peru that have capacities, that have uh, capacities for molecular diagnosis, uh, work together with uh, regional laboratories like, for instance, a reference a laboratory center here in Amazonas. So we can build capacities and we can also transfer SOPs and make sure that the health workers over there know how to use this information in order to, uh, in order to uh, take appropriate measures for the communities and help them to deal with these diseases, with malaria and other infectious diseases. And of course, our plan, as part of this program, we also need to keep in consideration that the local government is very important to provide or to help with, uh, with the logistic necessary and make sure, and with the resources to make sure that uh, this uh, response network can continue in time. Because uh, when we work with a particular area, let's say Amazonas, and we transfer the technology, sometimes we, uh, we train people and we try that these uh, projects start, we need to make sure that they will continue in time. Otherwise, uh, it works, everything works perfectly. Let's say for a year, we have resources for two, three years. And then after that, uh, if there is no a continuation, malaria comes back. That is something that we have seen uh, uh, previously also uh, in Loreto. So what we're trying to establish here, it's, it's a network that uh, will, uh, will be established in this area and that can have the local support or the regional uh, government support to continue and to monitor and hopefully eliminate uh, malaria in this area. So one key aspect uh, for this uh, for this network to work is actually to build um, a consistent 
uh, malaria molecular surveillance platform. And in our laboratory, what we have is, uh, of course, as you can see here, two Illumina machines, one NEXEC 500 and one MINISEC Illumina machine. And this one and the little one works perfectly to uh, make sure that we can uh, detect some drug resistance markers of uh, plasmodium, as well as uh, population genetic markers that can help us uh, answer some questions regarding uh, introductions and, uh, and also to monitor, for instance, uh, what is going on with, uh, uh, with uh, uh, multi, uh, polyclonal infections. So uh, this is something that we are actually working on right now. And the technology and the SOPs are being transferred from other laboratories or institutions as, such as CDC and Antwerp University. So currently, we're standardizing uh, uh, molecular surveillance protocols in collaboration with local academic and research institutions to ensure that the generated data from multiple sites can be compiled and compared. Because a problem that we have here and that uh, probably you have also faced in your countries is that uh, uh, academ academia and researchers actually share their information uh, in publications, but uh, sometimes they all use different platforms or they, they use different molecular markers and it's hard to compare them and to compile them and actually to provide this information to local authorities so they can take proper actions. So this is something that uh, we are building on. Uh, we are uh, generating uh, also a professional network between researchers from different universities in Peru and research centers. So we can agree on a, on, on a, on a similar protocol to make sure that the data generated can be easily analyzed in the same way and this information will be actually useful for the uh, for taking public health measures. Uh, because of this, we will generate a digital platform for continuous data sharing, and that is something that we are uh, trying to build in uh, in collaboration with the National Institute of Health of Peru. And of course, one of uh, our key aspects that I mentioned before is to transfer the technology and building capacity in the region. So health workers uh, in the regions, in Amazonas, in Loreto, can become proficient in the use and interpretation of molecular data, and uh, also in the use of uh, next generation sequencing data. Now, the applications that we have for this type of data uh, uh, as, as it has been mentioned before, uh, we have several uh, different types like identify local transmission, which is very important. This is, this is helpful to target interventions on hotspots and high risk groups. We can reconstruct transmission chains so we can conduct interventions to interrupt this uh, transmission. We can detect drug resistance and uh, this will help us to deploy measures against recrudescence and identify areas for enhanced surveillance. And something that uh, we're also building in this platform is uh, the possibility to detect co-infections because uh, parallel to our malaria platform, we are setting up a, a platform for detecting uh, parasitic diseases because this is an area with several, uh, several other infectious diseases. Uh, and we are trying to target first parasitic diseases and then we're gonna build up with bacterial diseases and uh, viral diseases. However, uh, and before we go, I move into that, we are currently uh, collaborating with uh, Cayetano University to uh, work with uh, whole genome sequencing of COVID, uh, of SARS-CoV-2, of SARS-CoV-2. And we have already uh, built uh, a laboratory to, uh, to diagnose uh, uh, COVID cases. So I think we are on the right track to make sure that uh, we can uh, cover the necessities of this area, particularly in the current pandemic situation. Now, as I was mentioned before, uh, genomic data is very important for uh, several types of, of, of research. And one of them is outbreak investigation. We have reported before 
uh, an outbreak of uh, plasmodium falciparum cases in Cusco, which uh, cases were not reporting, reported since the 50s. So given these genomic tools, we were able to identify that uh, the cases uh, correspond uh, to uh, an introduction from Loreto, and actually um, a similar outbreak uh, was reported in previous years in Tumbes, given, given this uh, movement of people to Cusco and to Tumbes. Another important aspect for this uh, genomic information is the study of population genetics and especially bottleneck effect. With this, with this genomic data, we are able to track what, what is the effect of treatments or of change of treatments in time. We can see here an uh, extended Bayesian skyline plot showing us the number of cases in dot lines. And here in blue, uh, we can see the effective population size. So after an intervention or, or after a quartem intervention, for instance, we can see that uh, the genetic diversity has a decrease and that uh, and if um, a particular treatment is effective or not. Now we can also use these tools for uh, monitoring treatment efficacy. For instance, if we have, uh, if, if we monitor the parasite or, or the sample at day zero and after a treatment, we can see we, if we, there is some similarity between these parasites or not in terms of genomics. So we expect that if the treatment is uh, efficient and we see that the person uh, has uh, the parasite, then it might be a reinfection and not a, a, a recrudescence. So that is something that we can use genomics tools also to, uh, to basically monitor efficacy of treatments as we have done before uh, in collaboration with, uh, with uh, Dr. Alexander Oliveira. Now, I also mentioned that we are collaborating with uh, some COVID research and this is very important because uh, there are some uh, hypotheses that malaria induce immunosuppression um, and this could lead to milder manifestation of COVID. So in order to uh, also combine or, or see the effect of, of malaria and COVID in patients, we have uh, started building uh, our, our laboratory uh, in the Tropical Institute of Health. And what we are seeing right now is that people from the, from the region, actually from the regional direction of health, are working perfectly with, with COVID samples and they are providing diagnosis in a very fast manner. So the second step with this laboratory would be to uh, start working with uh, genomics and provide uh, the identification of the SARS-CoV lineage that are circulating in Amazonas. We have also contributed uh, with GSAID with, with 30 uh, complete genome uh, samples that uh, we perform at Cayetano University and hopefully will be um, getting more information from our lab to uh, to continue contribute with this uh, with the information of this disease in Amazonas where we don't have much information. Uh, another aspect that I would like to uh, to present here is that not only are we working with uh, with building these genomic platforms, but we also want to move uh, a step forward and use this information to build point of care tests. So for this particular project, we have uh, Dr. Rafael Tapia Limonchi, who is the lead of this project. And he's building right now uh, POCTs using electrochemical biosensors. So they can, so he can detect different types of uh, parasites and particularly differentiate between malaria species. That is one of the goal. And the second goal is to uh, be able to track or to differentiate uh, 
particular mutations, like for instance, mutations associated with K14 that might be circulating in this area. So far with the genomic information that we have, we haven't seen any, um, any particular uh, parasite with mutations associated with uh, artemisinin resistance other than the 189 marker uh, lysine to treonine in, in K14. But we believe that this type of, of, of POCTs uh, are important to uh, be used in areas such as the one I described in Condor Kanki, where of course we don't have uh, any facilities to uh, implement more complex uh, analysis because of, of course of the lack of electricity, water, etc. So uh, we plan to build capacities at the health reference centers, but we are also thinking how are we gonna transfer uh, that knowledge or into the native communities. So we need to uh, be able to miniaturize and to try to build up on a chip uh, platform to uh, get information from the communities and be able to report in real time. So this is the, the, the lab that we are in right now and, and, and the collaborators and researchers working over there. Uh, our group, we have uh, Dr. Rafael Tapia and Dr. Juan Tejedo, which are uh, leading, as I mentioned before, the POCT work and also Dr. Juan Tejedo, who is working with uh, mesenchymal cells and treatment for neglected diseases. We have also uh, Clavel Diaz and Lisandro, Cecilia and Carla that are part of our group. Uh, they are students from uh, national universities and also well, we have also a, a, a student coming from, from Chile that is uh, joining our group. And uh, we also have some um, health workers from the regional direction of health that are current doing their master program with us. So uh, we are trying to uh, build those kind of capacities and transfer SOPs and technologies to uh, the local zones. For our collaborators, our national collaborators, we have um, Cayetano University, the Regional Direction of Health, number six, and uh, for internationals, we're working with CDC, Harvard, uh, Egg Institute, uh, Antwerp University, and the uh, Institute of Public Health of Chile. Well, thank you very much. And I hope you can uh, someday come and visit Amazonas, which is beautiful. We have very, uh, very, uh, very nice places to see. And hopefully we'll be able to build uh, an important institute here to deal with infectious diseases and malaria. Thank you so much, Stella. That's amazing. Uh, I definitely visit as long as you guarantee that anaconda will not make me dinner. <laughs> no, it won't hurt you, don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so we now have both presenters and they are ready to take your questions. So please keep typing your questions in the chat. We have several questions for Christian and uh, some for both. And to start with, I will give a chance to Abebe Ola, please unmute and uh, ask your questions one by one uh, so that Christian can respond. I will uh, encourage you to ask question, one question and let Christian respond and then finish all the three questions. Uh, so Abebe, please. Um, thank you, Dr. Deus. Um, and thank you, Dr. Christian, and it's a really wonderful, nice presentation. And I have... Um, um, two or three questions, but I will start from the first one. So currently after the withdrawal of chloroquine in different African countries, we are seeing that the chloroquine sensitive parasites are coming back. But in your presentation, you mentioned that chloroquine resistance is still high in Nigeria. So do you have any suggestion why the Nigerian parasites are still resistant to chloroquine, unlike other parasites in African setting? Uh, yes, the answer to that is very clear. Yeah, although officially chloroquine has been withdrawn in Nigeria, you can still find chloroquine, you can still find chloroquine to buy over the counter. 
So which means that uh, technically chloroquine is not withdrawn. And then there are seen many, many people that are still using chloroquine. Over. Go ahead, Bebe. Your second question. And the, the second question is that this, also you mentioned that uh, the SP resistance is high in Nigeria. So if I understand correctly, SP is still in use in Nigeria despite high resistance. So from your finding, did you communicate your result with the malaria elimination effort or program workers to revisit treatment guideline? Yeah, we still, we see pretty much, uh, we're working very close collaboration with the National Malaria Elimination Program. There's nothing that we do without them. We are the reference lab for molecular genotyping for malaria parasites. So all of the samples that we receive come from the National Malaria Elimination Program. So we, I will give them the result, the feedback. But then don't forget uh, the fact that, you know, uh, we live in an environment where there are co-infections. And then by the way, by you, when you use antibiotics, many antibiotics, you know, in an environment where you have bacterial infection and malaria infection, co-infection can drive the DHFR and DHPS, you know, genome in a way that you don't imagine. So why are you trying to, you know, you're talking about residual drugs that could be very, very, you know, I mean, that could be in fact, that, that, that could be driving, shaping the genomes in a very completely different way. So I think, you know, it's not just always about SP, but there are also many other drugs that could actually, you know, drive the selections in the genomes of malaria parasite, even when they are not treating malaria. Over. Go for your final question, Abebe. Great. Thank you, Christiania. Yeah, this is my last question. So I also work with Bivax and then usually the uh, Bivax parasites are not common in other African countries. Most of the time common with this, related with the DAPI antigen issue. It was more or less common in a, um, especially in Ethiopia, etc., and Madagascar. But currently, you guys seeing Bivax in Nigeria. So I'm uh, wondering if you look the travel history of this patient. I'm thinking whether these cases are more imported cases, as you mentioned, from, from South America, or are they local cases? Thank you. This last question. Yeah, Thank these you. are local cases. Yeah. These are local cases, and then these are very surprising findings. They're actually found in local and indigenous people that have no travel history. And I think, you know, we're not saying that they were imported from South America. We have no history of uh, travel for those people. But what we're basically speculating, and then we, we did a molecular clock on this, uh, on this, on this parasite, and they're pretty old. So I think this is basically just uh, sharing some information with you. So, but it's uh, we we're thinking that maybe it is something circulating, you know. And then who knows? Maybe who knows? It's very possible that you know the the whole theory of Bivax just using you know dolphin dolphin negative people. It may not be. It it probably may not be necessarily true. I'm not saying that that is the case, but there may be alternative pathways. Who knows? So I think. It's just that thing that we should be thinking about that. Over. Thank you, Christian. Before we go to the next question, could you clarify where these uh, symptomatic patients attended at health facilities or asymptomatic cases from the community? And these were symptomatic patients. You know, these are symptomatic patients. And then what really brought them to hospital were uh, passive from malaria. You know, mm -hmm. and then in the process, when you actually sequencing, you start seeing some of some you start seeing some rates that are unexpected. You know, and that really drives you to start going back and then try to dig a little bit more. Over. Were they falciparum negative? They were actually falciparum positive. So that's okay. That's, so that's, mixed that's, infections. Yeah. Right. Okay. Great. To give a chance to Stella, Stella, we had the question from a colleague. Um, Audrey, and um, because this question goes to both, I will ask it on the behalf of the of our colleague. Uh, Stella, could you tell us what training and education opportunities are available in Peru? Christian will also want to hear from you, but let's first hear from Stella. Yes, uh, thank you, Dios. So uh, currently, all the bioinformatic training and genomics training 
I basically uh, related to academia. So we have uh, some universities that are uh, very knowledgeable on this and that have very well trained professionals, like in Cayetano, and also we're trying to build that in uh, the national uh, university that I am in right now. Uh, however, most of the funding for this comes from the national, uh, from, from the na national agency in Peru called Fondesit. Uh, and they provide a uh, particular funding for uh, graduate students to be able to, to be trained in bioinformatics and to also do, do some, um, some uh, training in uh, foreign universities, for instance. And that's why we built uh, agreements with uh, Antwerp University, with uh, a Harvard University, so we can make sure that these students are uh, well trained and can also stay here. Or if they if they do their programs here, and they have the opportunity also to learn from uh, researchers, uh, from international researchers, and uh, what we're trying to do is that these uh, professionals, these health workers, will stay here and will build capacity here. So that is what what we have right now, and we are trying to use these uh, national funds that uh, we earn through, through projects to make sure that uh, we can build bioinformatic capacity and that uh, our graduate students uh, get trained. Thank you, Stella. Before we move on to Christian on this topic, I, I think we need some, some clarity. If you remember the Venn diagram by Christian, we had education, and then we had capacity building in the middle. And then on the extreme right, we had research. In the capacity building component, I think there is something we need to be clear of. And this is training for career, like you want to have a PhD or a master's or a postdoctoral attachment. And then we have kind of on-job training or structured courses tailor-made for a particular aspect. For example, if we want to train people in the network building or machine learning. So do you have both or you are concentrating on one? That is tailor-made causes, but you don't over, offer degree causes. We need to have that clarity for the sake of our audience. Yes, currently we are focusing and uh, basically in, as you mentioned in academia, in having well-trained uh, graduate uh, research students to, to, to have these capacities. And we are trying to move forward to the to 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 the other aspect that you mentioned for uh, job purposes or for uh, people working in the local uh, regional laboratories. However, what we are uh, trying to do to to be able to join both efforts is inviting uh, these health workers at the at the regional reference centers to the master's program or to the PhD programs. So they can uh, build or they can have uh, these, these capacities as well. But of course, we know that once we have uh, these, uh, these students, these graduate research students well-trained or these uh, health workers that are getting their master's or getting their PhD, it will, be, it will be easier for us to set up uh, courses or regular courses for, uh, for uh, all type of health workers that are trying to uh, understand uh, how this molecular uh, surveillance platform works. Thank you so much, Stella. Christian, over to you. Can you tell us what training and education programs you have in Nigeria, uh, focusing on both aspects, the educational part, master's, PhD, and postdoc, and then a capacity-centered, capacity-building-centered training. Can you briefly tell us what you- Yes, we do, all of, we, we do have all of those components. Right now, I have two postdoc in my lab from different African countries. Uh, and then for master's and PhD, we do have a master's in molecular biology and genomics and then a master's and PhD in bioinformatics. And then these programs that I'm talking about are fully internationally accredited. So, and, and when it comes to short-term training, we provide, we provide what we call a summer genomic bootcamp. 
So the boot camp is actually for people that want to understand, I mean, want to study or grasp, grasp the skills of next generation sequencing training. And we'll do this is an eight week, eight weeks training in summer is really intense. And then we bring people from many countries and then we train them for eight weeks. And, um, and then those are the kind of uh, specialized training that we can offer. So that's for NGS, but we also offer trainings for bioinformatics, you know, short-term, I mean, what do you call it, short-term trainings in bioinformatics and then audio uh, and any specific skill. You know, for instance, we've dealt with uh, some, uh, the Nigerian army, the Ghanaian and then the Liberian army, they wanted the military officer to have specific skills and which we gave them when it comes to real-time data analysis and real-time, you know, um, gen genomic analysis. So we do some of those things you know, I mean, depending on the need. Over. Thank you, Christian. We do have two more questions. And because of time, I will ask both of them. And the first is to you, Christian. Which part of India, this is from our colleague Narayasana, Narayanasami Gurusami, from, uh, who is on, also on the call. Which part of India is having polymorphic PF and ACT drug resistant forms? Uh, well, I think that should be that should be going to my graduate student that is working on this stuff. I really don't know. <laughs> I <have to> tell <laughs> okay. <you>. Okay. <laughs> I, I hope you we can we can connect and get the answer for our colleague. And, and the final question goes to both. Uh, Stella, uh, what would it take to conduct a routine genomic study to monitor progression of, of K13 mutations? And we, uh, I mean, how do you do it? Uh, is it through TS or through surveillance or whatever? And Christian would also want to hear from you. How would that be done? Stella? Yes, Warren. Well, currently we are doing uh, as part of, uh, of surveillance work. And uh, to be honest, uh, this was uh, funded basically by research projects. So this was an effort done by, again, academia and researchers, but not by local authorities as part of a public health program, which we believe is important to, to have. So that's why with uh, this uh, project that we have that uh, has been funded, we are trying to implement as part of the regular uh, uh, policy for malaria uh, control. And that's why we're integrating local governments because the, the regional government uh, is able to provide uh, funding to support further investigation, to support the surveillance of K-13 if we set up uh, everything nicely in the area. So that's why we want to have the NGS platform, but of course, we also have regular uh, sequencing. And what will be more, more important is once we have the POCTs, uh, or, or the lab on a chip platform, that is going to be very supportive for the area because at least we're gonna be able to uh, have an, an idea of what is going on for the particular mutations that have been reported or have been associated with the resistance. But in the meantime, we are doing as part of surveillance and we're trying to transfer this as a, a national program supported by the, the regional uh, by, by the regional government. Thank you, Stella. Uh, Christian, do, do you have anything to add on how would it take to conduct surveillance of K13 mutations? Well, I think this person is talking about PMI that is funded every two years. I think you can use, uh, in Nigeria, we, call, we have what we call um, malaria indication indicator surveys. So and these surveys are done on sentinels at every year. So I think that can be used you know, as a way to conduct this. So I think that's very much what I can say. Over. OK. We have the very last question from El Hajja Madun from Senegal. And this is to you, Christian. Um, it says, my question goes to, uh, to you. Uh, any guidance on the way for any collaboration or mobility of research and capacity building with your center? You just well, have think, a hard no. Yeah, we do have. Want, <laughs> the opportunity. Yeah, we do have, yes, we, we do have the opportunity. I think you can check the website of our centers, but then we're also collaborating with the Sheikh Antelib University in Senegal. You can reach out to uh, to our website, and then if he's interested in coming to do some work, we're pretty much open to it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Christian and Stella, for the wonderful talk and, and the discussion. We 
unfortunately, we don't have any more time. It has been great, a great opportunity to, to, to talk to you and hear the, about the exciting work you are doing. Uh, to wind up, I'll give you uh, not more than 30 seconds uh, to give your final remarks. Christian, and then Stella will be the last. I, I just want to say thank you for the opportunity and then uh, it's been a pleasure and then uh, MESA should continue the good work that they are doing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Christian. Stella? Yes, thank you very much for the opportunity. And also, uh, I think it's very important this kind of webinars because it helps us to uh, also interact with other uh, professionals and be able to learn for them and build up capacities in our countries as well. Thank you. Thank you both. And thank you, ever, thanks to everyone who attended our webinar today. It's a great pleasure to have you. And I hope if we have other questions which have not been addressed, uh, our organizers will get us a, 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 mini, a way to answer them and give you some answers. So for me, it has been a great opportunity to moderate this, the webinar and listen to the speakers. And again, the Q&A session also was great. I wish to take this opportunity to say a big thanks to our back behind the scene team uh, led by Sonia and Maria. You haven't seen them and I hope you won't see them but they have done a great work to make sure that everything went well from the start to the end. We had amazing time before to organize and make sure everything was well coordinated. And, and I'm sure you, are, you can attest to this, that it was a very well coordinated and I'm so humbled, so much humbled and, and, and grateful that we made it today. So over to you, Kate, for the final closure. Thank you so much. So yes, I'll echo your thanks to the speakers and also thanks to you, Deus, for moderating. Thank you for the team, certainly uh, working hard um, for, to prepare all of this. It was really seamless. Uh, thanks to all the participants for the rich discussion. We um, do have questions that we didn't have time to answer. We will follow up uh, on them. So please keep an eye out for the MESA newsletter. And we hope to see you at the next webinar, which will be the 1st of September. Um, and you will be able to follow us on, on the YouTube page. And the next webinar will be on insecticide and drug resistance moderated by our colleague, Abdullahi Jimde. So thank you all again and take care. See you next time. Bye everyone. <laughs> Thank Bye. you. Thank you. Thanks. It was very interesting. Thank you.